In this chapter, we'll introduce acid-base titrations. Now, in general, a titration is an experimental technique where you measure the volume of what we call titrant, which is contained in a burette, that's required to exactly react with a solution that's in a container, either a flask or a beaker, that's positioned below the burette. There are many different types of titrations. If the titration involves an acid-base reaction, we call it an acid-base titration. What information can you gain by carrying out an acid-base titration? You can determine the concentration of an acid. If you know the concentration of base to start with, you could determine the concentration of the of a base, if you knew the concentration of the acid you started with, you could determine the Ka of a weak acid or the Kb of a weak base. Some important things to remember here that we'll emphasize when we talk about titrations. First of all, you need to be aware of or know the stoichiometry of the acid-base reaction that you're carrying out. In other words, you need to be able to write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction. The reaction needs to be one that goes to completion. You don't want it to reach an equilibrium where there is significant amounts of reactants remaining. And you need to be able to detect when the reaction's over, in other words, the equivalence point. Now, since the molecules and ions involved won't talk to you during the experiment, you need to add some sort of indicator that will tell you or shout out to you when the reaction's complete. The indicator will change color, hopefully right at or near the equivalence point. So the point at which the indicator changes color, you call the endpoint, and you choose an indicator whose endpoint is as close to the equivalence point as possible. Before we leave this slide, I want to just emphasize that the key to a titration is careful measurement of the volume of titrant that you need to add to reach the equivalence point or to completely react what you start with in the flask or the beaker. What we're doing in a titration is we're counting things. And in many cases, titrations are set up so you know a lot about the solution that's in the burette. You don't know as much about the solution in the flask. And from the volume of titrants you add, you're literally counting the number of either molecules or ions that you're interested in in the flask. Let's look at an example of an acid-base titration. And this one is in a category called the a strong acid, strong base titration. A student finds that it takes 19.50 milliliters of 0.1219 molar sodium hydroxide, that would be in the burette, to titrate 25 milliliters of a solution of perchloric acid in the flask to the equivalence point. We can use this information to calculate the molarity of the perchloric acid. Now, as I said, from the way this is worded, we assume that the sodium hydroxide is in the burette. We know its concentration and we know the volume that was required to completely react with all the perchloric acid that was in the 25 milliliter volume in the flask. We just don't know what the volume of the, or excuse me, what the molarity of the perchloric acid is. So recall from the previous slide that we need to know the stoichiometry of this acid-base reaction. We need to be confident that the reaction went to completion. 
and we need to be able to detect with a minimum error the equivalence point of the titration. So again, what we need to do is choose an indicator that will give us a distinct color change, in other words, an easily discernible endpoint at or very near the equivalence point. Now to do this, we need to have a good idea of what the pH is expected to be when the reaction is complete. Let's work through this. So I restate the problem here and we'll go through the steps. What about the stoichiometry of this reaction? Well, it's pretty simple. Sodium hydroxide from the burette reacts with perchloric acid in the flask to make sodium perchlorate in water. It's a one-to-one -one reaction. One mole of sodium hydroxide is required to react with every mole of perchloric acid. The reaction needs to go to completion. Now, I'm just going to state here and not show it or prove it, but strong acid, strong base reactions do proceed essentially to 100% completion. Let's calculate the concentration of the perchloric acid in the flask, the original concentration before we started adding titrant in that 25 milliliter sample. We need to count how many sodium hydroxide formula units we added. We can do that by taking the volume we added from the burette and multiplying by the known concentration. So we've delivered 2.377 times 10 to the minus three moles of sodium hydroxide from the burette to reach the equivalence point. The number of moles of perchloric acid that we counted, titrated, in the flask would be exactly equal to the number of moles of sodium hydroxide we added because it's a one-to-one -one reaction. So this is how many moles of perchloric acid that were in the flask to begin with in the 25 milliliters sample that was in that flask before we started. So we take the number of moles of perchloric acid, divide by the volume of that perchloric acid before we started. So we've counted the number of perchloric acids, we divide by that original volume and we get a concentration. That would be our concentration of perchloric acid that we determined by titrating it with a known concentration of sodium hydroxide. Now, finally, if we wanna pick out an indicator, we need to have some idea of what the pH will be when the reaction's over. So here I rewrite the reaction and we realize that sodium perchlorate is an ionic compound. It's dissolved in water, so it really would consist of sodium ions and perchlorate ions. We know from previous lectures that sodium ions are neutral in water. A perchlorate ion would be neutral in water because it's the anion of a strong acid. So what we have when the reaction's over at the equivalence point, is simply water, sodium ions, perchlorate ions, therefore we'd expect the pH to be seven. So what indicator should we try to use? Well, here's a chart of indicators that give the pH ranges for the color changes to expect for each possible indicator. We said the pH should be seven. We started with around a pH of one in the flask. It appears that the best choice would be bromothymol blue indicator because if we start at around pH one, we add sodium hydroxide and when the reaction's over, it's pH seven, you can see that there should be a yellow to blue color change. Seems reasonable. Interestingly, phenothaline is normally the indicator of choice even though its color transition from colorless to pink isn't exactly at pH seven. 
this seems rather strange. There's a couple reasons for this. First of all, it's typically easier uh, with your eyes to detect a change from no color to color. That's the advantage that phenothalin would have over bromothymol blue. You could also imagine a little bit of a struggle because with bromothymol blue, because going from yellow to blue, you might expect a transition of green and you're not quite sure when it goes from green to blue, green to blue. We still have this problem that the phenothalene seems to be out of range. Something we'll cover very soon when we talk about titration curves is that while you're adding that sodium hydroxide and the pH is changing and going up, of course, in the flask while you're stirring it, the pH changes very rapidly near the equivalence point. And remember, the most important uh, number you need is the number of milliliters of sodium hydroxide added from the burette. When you get close to the equivalence point in a strong acid, strong base titration, the pH can change by several pH units with half a drop. And so the pH is changing so fast that you'll see this color change and you won't have much error called titration error, it turns out, in the measuring the volume of titrant that you've added. So what would you expect to see in the lab? And many of you have probably already done this titration or one very much like it in Gen Chem lab or even in high school. When you start out, you'd expect the flask to have no color if you were using phenothalene because it's in the uh, below pH 8 region. It's just perchloric acid. When you start to add sodium hydroxide, you might see a, a little burst of pink. We call that a locally high concentration of sodium hydroxide, which causes the pink color. But as soon as you stir it, the color goes away. And then at the end point, which we hope is very close to the equivalence point, the phenothalene turns pink and stays that way. Let's look at a second example of an acid-base titration. This time, we're going to titrate a weak acid by a strong base. Remember, previously we titrated a strong acid with a strong base. So here's the scenario. The question is asking what volume of 0.1219 molar sodium hydroxide would be required to titrate 25 milliliters of 0.09508 molar acetic acid to the equivalence point. There are some differences in this example as opposed to example one. First of all, in this example, we're titrating a weak acid rather than a strong acid. In this particular question, the way it's worded, we already know the concentration of acid in the flask, the 25 milliliters of 0.09508 molar acetic acid. And we already know, of course, the concentration of the titrant. What we're asking here is just how much titrant sodium hydroxide would we expect to be needed to titrate the sample of acetic acid. So in a sense, there's no analyte here. We already know the concentrations of both the acid and the base. So as I said, we're being asked to calculate the volume of the titrant that will be required to reach the equivalence point. Well, if we can just calculate the volume of titrant necessary to reach the equivalence point, why bother to set up and carry out a titration experiment in the lab? Well, that's a good question. Well, here's a scenario that would not be uncommon. Suppose you have a bottle in the lab and it's labeled 0.09508 molar acetic acid, but it was, it was prepared a long time ago by someone who no longer works in the lab. 
and your supervisor asks you to confirm that that's what the concentration of acetic acid is. So now you do need to go to the lab and set up a titration. Now, if you can calculate the expected volume required, this will make the titration easier to do in the lab because you have an idea of where the equivalence point is, meaning maybe not what the equivalence point pH is, at least not yet, but you have an idea of what volume you're going to need. So it doesn't take so long to do the titration. So let's work through this step by step. Restating the problem right here. Remember, there are a few things we need to know. We need to know the stoichiometry of this acid-base reaction. Again, this is pretty straightforward. Sodium hydroxide plus acetic acid would produce sodium acetate plus water. So it's a one-to-one -one reaction. The reaction needs to go to completion. Well, the strong base will drive the reaction with a weak acid to essentially 100% completion. Let's do some calculations. How many moles of acetic acid were in the flask initially? Well, we know there was 25 milliliters of the acetic acid at a concentration of 0.09508 moles per liter. So we can calculate the number of moles of acetic acid that were in the flask originally. Well, how many moles of sodium hydroxide from the burette will you need to exactly react with this acetic acid? Well, it would be the same number of moles of sodium hydroxide as moles of acetic acid that are, were in the flask to start with because it's a one-to-one -one reaction. So what volume of this sodium hydroxide solution would you need to deliver from the burette in order to deliver this many moles of sodium hydroxide? Well, that's easy. The number of milliliters required would just be the number of moles times the reciprocal of the concentration. So we're doing this so the moles of sodium hydroxide cancel we're left with the liters of the sodium hydroxide solution, which we convert to milliliters. So we get 19 and a half milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Remember the third thing here is that you need to be able to detect the equivalence point of the titration, which means you need to have a handle on what the pH would be. Well, the pH at the equivalence point when you titrate a weak acid by a strong base is not seven. It's greater than seven. Now, why is that? Because the products of the reaction are sodium ion, acetate ion, and water. Sodium ion is neutral, but acetate ion, which is the anion of the weak acid, acetic acid, hydrolyzes in water to produce a small amount of hydroxide. And that's what makes the pH greater than seven. But let's look at this in a little more detail. Here's our reaction. It goes to essentially 100% completion. The sodium acetate is actually in the form of separated sodium ions and acetate ions. Sodium ions are neutral. Acetate ions are basic. And so at the equivalence point, the pH is greater than seven because you have water, sodium ions, and acetate ions. And here we wanna also make note that the total volume in the flask is 44.5 milliliters. When you reach the equivalence point, the 25 that were in the flask to start with, plus the 19 and a half milliliters of sodium hydroxide you added from the burettes. So the total solution concentration would be 44.5. We can actually calculate the expected pH. We know it'll be greater than seven, but we can actually calculate a more exact number 
And the way we can do that is at first just calculate the concentration of acetate ion at the equivalence point. Well, that's pretty straightforward. It's the number of moles of acetate at the equivalence point, which would be equal to the number of moles of acetic acid we started with. We've now converted all of the acetic acid to acetate. So we have this many moles of acetate in a total volume of 44.5 milliliters. So we calculate that at the equivalence point, the acetate concentration would be 0.05342 molar. We can now set up an ice table and calculate the pH of this acetate solution. Remember again, the acetate undergoes hydrolysis with, uh, with water. The Kb value is 5.56 times 10 to the minus 10. We could get that from the Ka of acetic acid and the Kw of water. So we set up our ice table for acetate plus water, reforming a little acetic acid, unionized acetic acid and hydroxide. We go through the usual procedures of setting up an ice table. And by the usual methods, we calculate X, which would be the concentration of hydroxide at equilibrium. The pOH would be 5.26 and the pH would be 8.74. So this is a general result, meaning the pH at the equivalence point will be greater than seven when you titrate a weak acid by a strong base. In this case, the pH is 8.74 and the exact value will depend on the concentration of the ion and the Kb value of that uh, ion or anion in water. Now, what about a suitable indicator for this titration? Well, using the same chart of indicators and remembering the initial pH was 2.39, it looks like thymol blue would work because pH 8.74 is smack dab in the middle of its color transition. But as before, phenothaline would probably be our choice for the usual reasons that it's typically easier to see colorless to a colored transition, here colorless to pink, than it would be from one color to another. And here, as opposed to the strong acid, strong base titration, the color transition range for phenothaline is right at about the right spot. So that's probably what would be used. Let's uh, take a second or two for a common sense check. You, you probably have noticed or observed that there's something strangely familiar about this particular example of titrating a weak acid by a strong base that similar to the first example, uh, that this was done on purpose. So in example one, we saw that it took 19 and a half milliliters of 0.1219 molar sodium hydroxide from the burette to titrate 25 milliliters of a 0.09508 molar solution of the strong acid, perchloric acid, in example two, we saw that it took the exact same amount of the exact same concentration of sodium hydroxide to titrate the exact same volume and concentration of a weak acid, acetic acid. Now, does this make sense? Well, yes, it does. Because what you want to remember is that tit titrations fundamentally involve counting. So in each case, the sodium hydroxide solution that was in the burette is reacting with, or in other words, counting the same number of moles of acid in each example. 
2.377 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of perchloric acid in example 1 and 2.377 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of acetic acid in example 2. And both titrations involve one-to-one -one reaction stoichiometries. However, the pH values at the equivalence points are not identical because the acid-base properties of the products of the strong acid, strong base titration are different from those of the titration of the weak acid, acetic acid by sodium hydroxide. In part two of this lecture, we will look at two more examples of acid-base titrations. And then at the end of part two, on one slide, we will summarize our four examples and compare the results.